I always like it when they say, we're going to wrap up at this time. Patrick, you go as long as you want. Okay. Of course, we use that. We did the reverse of that um, when I teach at universities. And some people mentioned it. Yes, I do teach at Ohio State um, special courses for the continuing medical units for doctors, nurses, that sort of thing, and, and some others. But they're, they're drive-by teaching, friends. You know, I'm just there for a day. And all they have to do is survive it. There's not a test at the end. Been doing it for 28 years. And people have said, oh, you big Buckeye fans. No. I just let them put money in my pocket. Doesn't, yeah, I've been to, been to one game, and that's because somebody gave me tickets. I took a book. Uh, anyway, an amazing story. We've only got an hour to do this. And we're going to do a story, and then we're going to take, talk, uh, talk about how to apply all of this in being Jesus. Which sounds like, uh, who do you think you are? No, that's what we're supposed to be. We're supposed to be God with skin on. We're supposed to look like it. So, Luke 7 is where we're going to go for an amazing story and for amazing omission in the story. Especially when compared to the woman caught in adultery. First of all, here's a shocker. Luke 7, verse 36. When one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him, he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. I'm already impressed by Jesus because who wants to go to the Pharisee's house? You know, ain't no party like a Pharisee party. Um, <clears throat> That's like, it's like when churches sometimes goes, well, we don't want our kids going to the prom, so we're going to do an alternative prom here in our church building. And it's always horrible because <laughs> it's planned by people who think fun is sin and they prove it. <clears throat> Jesus, Jesus would eat with the most awful, terrible people, but he also ate with the awful, terrible people who thought they weren't. And so he goes. He reclines at table. Just by the way, why do they recline at table? At that time, medical knowledge, being as it was, Galen was one of the first to write this down. They believed that you digested better if it didn't have to plop. So you laid, and your feet would be. I've seen pictures where their feet were right up against the next person's head. No, feet pointed away on an arm. And you use this hand, always the right hand. If you're a Jew, that's the clean hand. Same with Muslims. They will not eat from the left hand. Left hand's what you use for toilet, for cleaning things, right? So uh, that's where he is. A woman in that town who lived a sinful life. Well, that sounds a little echoes, doesn't it? Chapter four of John. Learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house. So she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. As she stood behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. Now, we know this story. We know this story, and we have no clue about this story. If this was being read 50 year, 8050, 8150, 8350, there would have been shock and gasp, and the reader would have to stop until it settled down. Here's the thing. Got to stand up and move about for this. You didn't eat inside the house. Very few people had a house where you could eat with more than just your family. And generally speaking, you didn't even eat with them inside the house. Inside the house it wasn't where the kitchen was. You um, Even in the South, you'll notice that some kitchens were off. And now they've been built too. And so you have that T-shaped house. It was out. Inside, you kept the cooking smells away. By the way, that's always fascinating too. You go overseas and they, they can't understand why Americans want an open house. Well, the smell of cooking would go places. Well, we look upon that as good because we don't eat what you do. Anyway, um, so you would have a courtyard. The courtyard would be defined, generally speaking, by just a short row of rocks. You didn't 
generally do walls as, as a private citizen. By the way, Romans had very, very strict laws on how high those could be, according to your class, what kind of haircut you could have, and what kind of clothes you could wear, and whether or not it could have a matching uh, girdle or belt about it. They had rules about it all. So we know exactly what's going on. So we're going to call this a wall, but it's probably a row of rocks, all right? The poor people, when they hear that there's food on, will come and stand around, and the rule was, you stay at the wall. Whenever the guests get up and walk, generally not inside the house, not much room, they would generally walk down the street, walk down to water, walk, walk to a hill, you know, another place. Then the poor people can come and eat. There were, um, the Old Testament had a very good welfare system built into it. You, um, you didn't collect a check every two weeks or every month. All that does is keep people poor. Instead, you would collect everything for a year, or in some instances, two years, right up front. Why? Because now you have money to buy goods and sell. You have money to buy property. You have money to buy, buy into a shop. You see? So unlike um, America, and far worse, the British system. British system is guaranteed to make you lose status throughout life. It's just awful. Uh, not enough to survive just enough to be angry. You know, um, anyway, so other things, we all know some of the things. For example, if you have a, a square field, you weren't allowed to harvest it as a square. You had to harvest it as a circle and leave everything on the edges for the poor. If you were carting it to market and some falls off, you cannot pick it up. That's for the poor. There were a lot of rules to take care of the poor. So the poor are all around. One of them is a well-known sex worker in town. And she is weeping. The Pharisees will know she's there. They've got their religious radar up. But that's her problem. They have their dinner. Except she's breaking from the wall. And she's crying over Jesus's feet. This is one of the hardest things to explain to people who are not first century Jews. And None of you are. All in the Hebrew language, you use wordplay. There are no curse words in Hebrew. By the way, there are no curse words in Arabic. They import them from English. Interesting. Instead, um, if you want to curse somebody, you do elaborate things. It's like, you know, the old country song, may the bird of paradise fly up your nose, or may the, you know, the gnats from a thousand camels armpits, you know, infest, that sort of thing, right? Very flowery um, curses. Mm. So once you know their language, well, here's another one. Uh, remember when Jesus called the devil uh, Beelzebub? When we all know that the word is Beelzebaal, or Beelz, um, most people pronounce it Beelzebel, he was using a linguistic twist that was very, very well known to make fun or to denigrate, because Beelzebaal, or Beelzebaal, as it would be pronounced, means Lord of the Manor or the Castle. He used Beelzebub, which meant Lord of the Flies. Now, there was an American president who had been schooled in this, and um, the first George Bush, um, was that Herbert Walker Bush, is that correct? During the first Iraq war, kept referring to Saddam Hussein as Saddam Hussein. And actually, commentators made fun of him for mispronouncing it. What you didn't know is that the DOJ and the NSA had schooled him on how to insult Saddam, because Saddam means mighty warrior. Saddam means mules behind. And so without Americans knowing what he was doing, he was infuriating the other guy. So you need to know all that language and understand that it's weird to us. But feet were a symbol or a stand-in for sexual parts. Think of the um, story of Ruth. When she snuggles up to the man who hasn't proposed yet, 
Therefore, she's going to handle that. The Bible says she uncovered his feet. Doesn't mean feet. In fact, if you remember the next morning, he was saying, you better get out of here before people see you. Uh, it wasn't because people are going to go, oh, wait, she made his feet cold. And if you're thinking, oh, they, you're sex before marriage, are you kidding? Yeah, um, the, they had a condition called humanity. And these things happened. And the Bible does not shy away from these things. You might have noticed a few stories if you pay attention. So did, G did this woman touch Jesus' sexual parts? No. But because of the linguistic connection, if you touched his feet, it was as if you did. You had crossed a massive no barrier. But she is so overcome by what she's living and what she's going through. She's crying on his feet. Then she touches them. Then she rubs them with her hair. Oh. Even today in these nations, you cover women's hair. It is considered sexual. It is considered beguiling. If you, um, in Iran right now, the morality police are beating women to death because some of them are protesting. And again, something your news has not taken you on. Since I work with federal agencies a lot, I hear this stuff and then I see the videos. And the morality police in Saudi Arabia got nothing on Iran. They just hung a young man because he attended a protest agreeing with the women. They hung him two days ago. And the uh, they beat women in public, and the, the people beating them laughed, and the women laughed with them. The worst religious police are the women. They are just awful. Anyway. So she's rubbing with it. She didn't have anything else to, I don't know if she was scantily clad. She didn't have any extra cloth. So she's rubbing his feet with his, and then she pours perfume. What was she using perfume for? It's in her business. You read uh, Proverbs chapters five, six, and seven, you get a pretty good idea of how sex workers used to use perfume and uh, perfumed beds and such to make their time with them far more attractive you know they hadn't invented antiperspirant uh bleach uh, uh, handy wipes the, none of these things um in fact i had one person say can you imagine going back a couple thousand years how pure and clean the air would smell and i'm going Are you kidding it would smell like horse exhaust sheep exhaust and sweaty humans you know, give me a diesel-powered Volvo in front of me any day. <clears throat> so all of this is going on right in front of Pharisees. Pharisees. These are the people that would bust you for watching Housewives of, I don't know, Beverly Hills, whatever they are, and calling that porn. This is the kind of people this was. And Simon has invited the guy, and you know all his Pharisee friends are now looking at him. Like, what if you were eating with this man? This man? That's very important. You get all of this. She has done everything possible that is wrong and scandalous. Oh, scandalous. So Jesus, well, first of all, Verse 39, when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know who's touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she's a sinner. Jesus answered him. Wait, wait, he didn't say anything. He said it to himself. So Jesus had some knowledge, didn't he? It's that thing. We don't know where the, the line is. And that line, by the way, may have moved from time to time as the Holy Spirit needed it. Uh, when we get to heaven, I've had people say, that's one of the questions I'm going to ask God. Not me. I have no questions. None. I do not want to annoy anybody in the administration. I do not want them to go back and double check the paperwork. <laughs> so, Simon, I have something to tell you. 
Oh, his voice would have been a strangled cry by this time. Tell, tell me, teacher. <laughs> Two people owed money to a certain money lender. One of them owned him 500 denarii. Know how much that meant? Doesn't matter. And the other 50, just use the numbers. Uh, denarii, they say, was a day's wage, but you know, with inflation. Neither of them had the money to pay him back. So he forgave the debts of both. Now, which of them will love him more? Now, see, he went to church here, so he didn't answer it directly. You people who keep thinking, I'm trying to pull you into something. Simon replied, I suppose. Wait, do, does anybody think Simon didn't know the answer? Simon thought he was going to get tricked. Why? Because that's what they did. I suppose the one who had the bigger debt forgiven. You've judged correctly. <laughs> then he turned toward the woman and said to Simon, do you see this woman? This is stop there. That's all he has seen. That is all he and his friends have seen and thought about for a very long time. Throughout the entire meal, that's all they've seen. Jesus is having fun. And I, I like that about Jesus. I want you to think for a moment. Do you remember in Romans chapter 1, we never talk about this. We need to. The Bible says through Paul that everything that can be known about God can be known by the things he created. Now, why do we not see that? Because it doesn't have any of our rules and doctrine in it. So we're going, no, 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 no. Alexander Campbell, by the way, said that we learn of God through two books, the Word of Scripture and Nature. Somehow the nature one got dropped away, and I think that's tragic. They're heading away. Good. I don't know who called immigration, but um, it's all they've seen. And by the way, uh, to close that loop, my God taught bees how to dance. My God stretched the necks of giraffes when we don't even need giraffes. I'm not anti-giraffe. I don't lay awake at night going, giraffes. But we don't necessarily need them. I've had people go, what, you wouldn't want them to go extinct? Yes, that's true. But 99% of everything that's ever lived has gone extinct. We watched the Jurassic Park 3 movie a couple years ago because we're very slow learners. And at the very, it's the one where the dinosaurs get out of control. You know, that one. <laughs> So near the end of it, military's trying to shoot the thing, and the lady's going, oh, no, it'll be extinct. And I'm going, it was extinct. You're the one that brought it back. We'll all be safer when it's extinct, and you're extinct. But again, movie people were nice about it, but we had to leave. The, they're, they're so upset but jesus is having fun and by the way i also love it that god lifted up the rear end of baboons and painted a rainbow so you had to look you know i didn't do it he said i came into my into your house you didn't give me any water for my feet but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair inside you could almost hear something going, eh, no you didn't give me a kiss but this woman from the time i entered has not stopped kissing my feet okay that was a new one we hadn't had that information before. That makes it even more awkward. You did not put oil on my head, but she's poured perfume on the feet. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven as her great love is shown. But whoever has been forgiven little, loves little. Then Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. Now, we're not done with this story yet. First of all, when this story is usually told in, in churches, it is us versus the Pharisees, isn't it? Look at these Pharisees being so judgmental and the like. But go on. In this story, we are the Pharisees. All of us, we are the Pharisees. Go on. They said to get this ready for church tomorrow. All right, so you do. And I'm up there preaching. And all of a sudden, halfway through the service, the doors go open. And there's, you know, Bambi LaRue, dressed for work, comes tottering up on her high heels and knocks me backwards off my feet. 
rips my shoes and socks off, starts crying and kissing my feet. Are you telling me you're going to be sitting there going, praise Jesus? <laughs> no, you're not. You're going to be going, Mike invited him. <laughs> exactly what's going on. Please remember who we play in this story. The other guests began to say among themselves, who is this? Basically, who do you think you are that for even forgives sins? Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. In other words, get out. He's got some work to do here. She doesn't need to be involved. There's another story like that that ends like that. And that's the story of Jesus healing the man that was paralyzed. And they took apart the roof of the building. Do you remember that story? Oh, that's a great story. When I was a boy, I loved that story because they got to do stuff to the church building and didn't get in trouble. House is packed. Men want their friend to be healed. He's paralyzed. From the phrasing of it, it seems that it was a recent paralysis. Now, I, I've not watched the program, and I have nothing against it at all. I just, I'm really, really busy. But uh, someone showed me a clip from The Chosen that seemed to indicate they looked upon it as a recent injury, like he'd fallen off a roof or something. So, of course, they take him up on another one. Jesus is preaching. A little bit more sunlight than there used to be, bits of dust coming down. And all of a sudden, eh, 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 eh. and you just know some people in the back are going, well, I don't approve of this. That's not the way we do church here. I knew the NIV would lead to this, didn't I tell you? And Jesus is just overwhelmed by this, and he goes, your sins are forgiven. That's his first instinct, is to forgive. Now think about that. We'll get back to the story, and then to this story. Hang on. I would take in some people over to Scotland. Um, it wasn't for a campaign or anything. We were just going to go visit friends. They wanted to come and see Scotland, so they came. And we found a parking place in Inverness, the capital up in the Highlands, um, which was quite the accomplishment. We were all very proud. Uh, and I opened my door. This is the door the driver opens over there because we sit the other side. Right? Um, and I, I wasn't looking. 100% me. And I nearly knocked a woman off the pavement. She, she dodged, jumped out of the way. And before I could say, oh, I'm so sorry, she goes, Jesus loves you, and kept walking. And I went, I, I, I know. I work for him. I have thought about that woman a thousand times. Her first instinct was to tell me that Jesus loved me. It wasn't, that, that would have been one of my top hundred, but not near the top. I would have gone, hey, watch it. Away you, you know, that sort of thing. But Jesus' first instinct is to forget. Does that make us feel a wee bit better about him? Um. By the way, that also means God's instinct is to forgive. When I was a boy, we painted it like God was fiercely angry. And Jesus, because he died for us and all, he's in the middle basically going, Dad, 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 uh, it's all right. I got him. And God's there just going, oh, sir. Now, I know you're holy God and such, but we got to let this smelly little human in because you know they're doing their best. No. You ever read Hebrews? Oh, read Hebrews. Oh my goodness, that'll blow you sideways. First chapter. If you if it doesn't blow you sideways, read it again for two months. Seriously. That Jesus was the express image, the exact representation of the Father. You want to know what Yahweh thinks about you? Listen to Jesus. You want to know what his instincts are? Listen to Jesus. What does he think about sex workers, Pharisees, and the like? What did Jesus say? Isn't that good news? That is overwhelmingly good news. No wonder that the majority of theologians in the first 250 years of the church were universalist. Origin, Gregory of Nyssa, we can go on. 
they believed everybody would be saved eventually because our God is a God of love. It wasn't until well after Nicaea and Rome got a hold of everything that we decided, let's use Plato's idea of hell and bring that in. Don't get me started. Because you're going to leave anyway, evidently. Back to the story. When Jesus then healed the man, he even said, okay, which is it harder or easier to say? Your sins are forgiven, or rise, take up your bed, and walk. Because it is, let's be honest, it's easy to say your sins are forgiven, because you can't see that. There's not a sin ometer that goes down, right? So he turns to him and goes, arise, take up your bed, and walk. The guy gets up, and Jesus then says, get your bed and get out of here. In other words, don't stay for church. Why? Gonna be a church fight. You don't want in your diary. Got healed today, then got my leg broken again in a church fight. Get out. Jesus loved him so much he didn't let him stay in church. Think about that. Come back to here. Have you noticed in Luke 7, there's a very big thing missing. Now, I don't want you to have pressure on you. I'm just letting the silence for a while, okay? It's in John 4, or John 8. It's not here. He never tells her to change anything. It is very, very possible that she had a couple of kids she had to feed. It is also very possible that she was a slave being pimped out by her owner. These were all common. He didn't tell her to stop because he knew she couldn't. So he just let her know she was forgiven anyway. You ever noticed that before? What are the ramifications of this? We deal with people who are sexually confused, others who are not confused at all. They're certain. I've had people ask me, I mean, day one when we started our safe harbor, you gonna let gay people in? And I'm going, we just tell people if you believe in Jesus, you're in. And if you don't, you're in. We're pretty exclusive that way. And I'm sure we have members that are just as conservative as they can be on that point. And I'm sure out there somewhere we've got members that are all of the alphabet and the plus sign too. I'm not here to judge or to close doors or the like. I didn't die for them. I didn't make the rules. I'm going to let God sort them out. A couple of people in my life, knowing that I was a shrink or I became a neuroscientist, got better. Less people. I usually only work with people once they're dead. They're very, very controllable, by the way, at that stage, compliant. Um, They've said to me, well, don't you think if these gay people just went to counseling, they get better? And I'll look at him and say, how many counseling sessions would you need to have before you wanted to have sex with a guy? And they'll shudder. I'll go, there you go. For some, it might be a lifestyle choice. For some, it was a driving from early. All I'm going to do is tell them about Jesus. What they do with Jesus is up to them and Jesus. I will not approve. And I will not disapprove. It's not my job. By the way, I've been fired for speaking engagements, not just at churches, but at universities, because I wouldn't say, I approve. I tell them, I'm not asking you to approve of me and my wife. I'm not asking you to approve of anything on, uh, I'm doing. I'm not going to approve anything you're doing. My job is to merely speak and without judgment or harshness to anyone. Because sometimes people can't repent. Sometimes they can't change. What do we do with them? My brother here was a counselor for substance abuse. I wouldn't want that job if he gave me five million a year. Try, try to give me five million. No, no. I would take it and do a lousy job. How's that? There are some people who will never be able to quit. 
Do we love him? Does he? Does he understand? This is in here for a reason. And he put it right there in a pretty powerful place. A Pharisee's house. Because that's where it belongs. You see, when I catch myself judging people, and I do, I do. I grew up in a very legalistic home um, and just got like alcoholism. That never really goes away. I'll catch myself judging a few people. I do. And I'm really sorry. I wish that were not true. But when I do catch myself, I have to pull back. Um, the devil's really tricky on that, by the way. It's not like he's having me judge sex workers that are like usually. I can remember we went to see my, my wife's parents in Central Te Texas. Um, we timed it wrong, so we had to be there over a Sunday. <laughs> Their church is what the church looked like in 1957, if you'd like to go see. They even called on one guy to pray, and God helped me. I didn't mean to do it, but I groaned. That guy prays forever. I timed it. It's 14 minutes. I quit caring two in, frankly. Because when you have to pray for the somebody's first cousin that knew a fellow what said hi to their neighbor, I've lost the ability to care. And then they sang songs that were all funeral march beat. And a preacher got up and said the same sermon. Basically, just this is what we believe, and you guys are good for believing it, and the other people aren't. And on the way home, God hit me with a fist at the side of my head, saying, who are you to judge them? Those people were fed today. Those people worshiped today. You critiqued today. You felt superior today. So you see what I mean about being sneaky? Judgment is so sneaky. We are the Pharisee's house. We live in the Pharisee's house. We are the ones who have to let Jesus forgive people we wouldn't and forgive people that we can't see ever changing and who may never change. So how, how can we be Jesus? Luckily for you, we have, we have the manuscript. We have the rule book. It is in Matthew 25. Now, I really wish it was its own chapter, but it isn't. You, I, everybody in the room knows that the Bible is not originally in chapters and verses, correct? You want to do yourself a treat? And I'm serious. A real treat? Find a, a copy of the Bible. You can get them on Amazon. You can get them on Christian book distributors which unfortunately is cbd.com. And I'm going, well, there's some people going to be very disappointed when they go to this. You can go to aid books or any of these, and you can find Bibles that have no chapter or verse divisions. It is life-changing because you're no longer reading in legalistic bullet points. You're reading a story. It's amazing. So do that. I wish the guy that divided these into chapters as he rode a donkey across France, and that is how he did it. I wish that his donkey had hit a pothole and he'd made a new one at uh, Matthew 25, 31. This is the only description we have of what happens after death from someone who knows. Now, how important should this be treated then? This is the only thing we've got. Now, in America, years and years ago, we'd come across and we would see, and I don't remember the commercials, and I, I'm sorry, the name, but somebody in here does. Um, was it in the 80s? That they would do, it had been before. Um, it was E.F. Hutton. And people would be talking about their finances, what was going to happen. And one would go, well, my broker is E.F. Hutton. And E.F. Hutton says, and then the camera would pull away because everybody's frozen in a restaurant or on the street and they're leaning in. Well, if Jesus goes, 
this is what happens after you die. Are you going to lean forward? Oh, yeah. Let's turn the TV off and turn the phones over, shall we? I'd like to hear what this has to say. Take it seriously, although it may offend and confuse you in a moment. But he's got something to say. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he'll sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him and he'll separate the people one from another as the shepherd she separates the sheep from the goats. He'll put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. By the way, if you're thinking, how hard can that be? Really, if you go to the Middle East, it is super hard to tell the sheep from the goats. They're all raggedy. They don't look like Scottish big puffballs. In Scotland, it's pretty easy to tell what a sheep looks like. And in Australia, they're like, yes. And we lived there when the first people cloned a living creature. They cloned a sheep. My wife looked at each other and I went, oh, good. More sheep. We have more sheep than people. But I mean, I don't know. Anyway, only God can separate because it's not easy. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. Everybody, we want to hear that, right? That's amazing, that is. And then he uses a very important word for, oh, here's the reason. If you want a to-do list to be like Jesus, this is it. I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty. You gave me something to drink. I was a stranger. You invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. By the way, that last, I go to prisons a lot, and mainly Louisiana State Penitentiary. I go to death row about once every six weeks, but on death row and life row, we have more than 60 men who use the notes from our sermon to do Bible classes among their fellow prisoners every week. We would have had more, but we've been able to get about 15 of them released so far. That's probably not going to happen now. They have a new governor who ran on. He's going to find a way to restart executions. Please pray for them. Bobby Hampton, one of my friends, has been on death row for 28 years, more than half his life. This is not pretty, but this is worse back then. Uh, I've been to Panama, and I remember we were driving past the thing, and somebody asked what it, that building was, because there are all kinds of women and children outside waiting. And they said, that's the prison. Well, the person asked, I, I, as soon as I knew it was prison, I knew what was going on. But they asked, well, the, what are all the people there? Is it like a family day? They said, no, they're bringing food to their prisoner. So you don't get food unless it's brought. You don't get clothes. You don't get toothpaste unless it's brought back then. And if you bring it, you're on a list and the government knows you're probably a bad person because you're visiting somebody we put in prison. So he's saying those who put themselves at risk for others, right? That will risk it. So for example, what I said a while ago about gay and not gay has put me at risk in some of your hearts. I know that. Because I would have, I would have judged that harshly twenty years ago, uh, and I get that, and I don't judge you for judging me. I get it. We're all on the journey, but putting yourself at risk by stepping in between and saying no. And Christians, we see something going down. We're not the people who recorded on our phones. We're the people that get in there. I'm a sixty-seven-year-old man. I'm not very big. I used to know an awful lot of how to fight and kill and such because I'd been trained rather extensively. But right now, if you yelled attack, I'd just have one. But I can at least delay the murder for a bit because you got to murder me first. And if it makes you miss a few years in a nursing home, let me tell you, it's still, it's a, it's a good deal. Put yourself at risk. Be him. By the way, don't be verse 37. Because if one of you is around me and go, 
no, that wasn't us. I'm going to hurt you. I don't know what we're going to be like physically or the like at, at this stage. I will find a way. I'm creative and vindictive. If you're in, don't rock the it. Don't be the kid as the teacher dismisses us that goes, aren't we supposed to have a test today? Don't be that kid. And we all know, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did you, we see you as a stranger and invite you in or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Now we know the negative comes up. We're not dealing with the negative today. We're not talking about don't be, we're talking about be. We've done this a few times already. What is missing? My brothers, sin, everything's missing. Where's the, what did you believe about worship? Where's the, did you take the Lord's Supper? Where's the, how did you organize your church? Where is the, did you only listen to, to holy music? Where is everything we fight and judge about? It's not part of the quiz. It's not part of the entry requirements. requirements. What have we done? 95%, and I, yes, that's a figure I just made up. 57.8% of figures are made up on the spot. 95% of our efforts, our money, and our fights are about Sunday mornings and our worship place. When Jesus died to get us out of the temple, because we're temples, and we're to be loosed in the world to be temples of God. Well, it's a temple. A temple is where you go to meet God. If people meet you, they should be meeting God. We are, as Paul put it, ambassadors for Christ. If What do you do at a temple? You go to get forgiveness of sins. I've had people say, well, you know, only God can forgive sins. No, he said if you forgive their sins, those sins are forgiven. So go forgive some sins. My wife and this sounds like I'm complimenting myself, and I'm sorry, but I'm just giving you an example. My wife says that she wishes people could hear me when I drive because I'm not yelling, what did you do? And, and, and Nashville traffic is as bad as Louisville traffic. It's worse. Oh, look at you. Well, evidently, after we found after the last storm and cold snap, we found out that our, our roads were made of paper mache. That's a problem. There are potholes now that a family of four can live comfortably in, and we do overcharge them. So um, that's important. I don't say anything angry. In fact, I'll say, "It's all right, girl. Come in, come in. We're, no, we're sharing. It's all right. You know, out. You know, flash a little bit of lights. Come along in." I don't do it because I used to always be angry. And God has humbled me, showing me my own sins. And if God will save me, and he will, he will save you. Paul said he was the chief of sinners. I say Paul didn't know me. And I'm not proud of it. I wish I could change it. I'd love to float in here on a cloud of my own righteousness. That's ah, not going to happen. But what I can tell you is I'm going to heaven and you are too. Get over it. Now, how should you live your life? I don't have any time to debate anybody about anything. I was asked to come out to Oklahoma Christian University and give the keynote for a lecture. That doesn't happen often because I'm I don't have any degrees in Bible. And I never went, well, I went to Freed Hardman back when it was a two-year school, but they really don't want anybody to know that, so I try not to mention it. Um, 
if they paid me, then maybe I would do like OSU, just do what they needed. But anyway, point is, I'm not usually qualified to speak at a Bible lectureship. And I'm not saying that except that it's true. I'm a neuroscientist who wrestles with God out loud online. And it seems to have hit a nerve, but I'm not a theologian. On Wednesdays now, by the way, if you remember, if you've been tuning in on Wednesday, um, one of my dear friends is Dr. Rick Hunter, an African-American theologian, minister of some great, and I've said, can you and I just sit at a table and talk through these stories? That's what you've been doing the last few months, so you may want to join. It's great to have a theologian there, because I'll say what this word means, doesn't it, Rick? Does that matter? Am I right there? And he'll correct me if I'm wrong. I, but I was asked to go. And it was on uh, the, the passage out of Peter to always be ready to give an answer. So I stood up. Right before I got up, the guy that had invited me said, just be aware, we have a small group of ministers who are always ready to jump on any of our guests. And they will probably come up and give you a hard time after. And I looked at him and I said, you've known this for how long? He says, oh, they've been doing it for years. And I said, you invited me 18 months ago and two minutes before I get up is when, you, when you bring this up. All right, fair enough. Well, I'm, I'm used to it. So I stood up and I told him the answer for my faith is Jesus. It's not that I can find archaeology. It's not that I can find linguistics. It's not that I can find the Bible's true here, there, or the other. My answer is Jesus. When I was done, here they came. Easy to spot. White shirts, ties, family edition sized Bibles. They surrounded me. They, they went on to name the errors I had made in great detail. And I just stood there. And they finally slowed down. I said, okay, what's the best thing I can do for you guys right now? They looked at each other. It's kind of funny when it happens. They started all over. Like I did, I wasn't there. I must not have heard. So they went through the whole thing again. I stood there. They were done. I said, I understand. And we might always disagree on that. But the important thing is, what's the best thing I can do for you right now? And they started going through a third time when the guy that invited me came in and he said, "Uh, sorry, guys, Dr. Mead, uh, we need Dr. Mead. There's a gathering over at the president's house. I found out that was a lie. They were just getting me out of there. Afterwards, I went, I was fine. I, I knew my response, and it was not going to vary. It was five years later, I get a phone call saying, do you remember that? And I'm going, yes, I do. He said, I was one of those men. I want to apologize. He said, the way you wouldn't fight back, but just offered to be kind to us, whatever we wanted, has haunted me. And he said, I'm be- I've begun to change my mind about some things. It's all it takes. It doesn't take mighty knowledge. It doesn't take giving a thousand dollars. It just means being kind. There is um, on YouTube and on Instagram one of the hottest video forms out there right now is people walking up to somebody, uh, and they do it a variety of ways. As in, you know, they're in a coffee shop and saying, "Listen, I don't have any money." Is there any way I could just have a cup of coffee and somebody either working there or around them will buy it for them? And and because people are nice, you know, somebody will go, okay. And then people will turn around and give them a couple hundred dollars. And they will find people who are poor in the supermarket. And you can tell from what they're choosing and what they're wearing. And they'll say things like, I, I wanted to get this sandwich, but I don't have any money. The poor people will give you money. And they'll turn around and give them a $300 gift card to the store. It's things like that. That's one of the forms, but there are many forms like that. You know, somebody making necklaces and they sell them on a table by the road. Uh, they, you know, how much is one? And they tell them and they'll say, that's, that's really great. How much for all of them? I want to be those people that have that unlimited money going around just doing that. But I got to tell you something. Those are valuable. Those are wonderful. I hope those continue forever. But what adds up 
are the little bits of kindness. The please, the thank you, the helping others, the reaching out. You could do a, a full-time ministry for Jesus Christ, go into the airport and be a nice to women who are trying to get children through the airport. With TSA doing all the hassling and business people going, ah, I've held babies on airplanes. I'm not naturally Dr. Nurture, but when I've seen people coming in and, and you see the people looking at, don't make eye contact, I'll say, have a seat. I'm a granda. We say da for dad and granda for so. And every one lady sat down and into the flight, she goes, I need to go to the restroom. Just handed the kid. Kid and I were both surprised. And they're looking at me, and I and I say, I, I don't know. Maybe we should be afraid. Um, we don't, you know. But again, did I do something great for Jesus? Yes, I did. Did I build a big mission or end racism or something? No, I can't do that. But I can give somebody something to eat. I can give them something to drink. I can give hospitality to people. I can get him clothes. I remember when my mom died, what do you do with the apartment full of stuff? You had an apartment in the living, assisted living. Um, Tennessee Boys Home is near us. That's a Church of Christ thing. And now in Kentucky, there was potters. Is that still around? Yes. Okay. Um, they, what I didn't know, um, I asked some of the workers there, they did the research. They came back and they said, um, they actually do more than just working with the boys. There's a boy whose mama gets out of rehab and she's going to be allowed to have him back, but only after she has an apartment that's furnished so he can live. I said, have we got a deal for you? So we moved all that furniture over, but we found, you know, they probably need some other stuff. They didn't have to buy a napkin. Now, why? Because that's what we do. It didn't cost me much. Most of it was stuff we already owned. It was just walking around trying to figure out the best way to give it. And how can we help? And then what do they need now? That question, what's the best thing I can do for you right now? It's one of the most powerful questions you can ask. And then follow up the best you can. I've had people say, I just need my car repaired. Well, yeah, I came to the wrong fellow there. But I know people. I have social media. Let's start looking. There's a guy named Ryan, I forget his last name, that has crossed the U.S. several times and has actually, in Europe, been able to fly back to the States all on a penny. It's really fascinating. He starts with a penny. All lodging, all food, all supplies have to come from the penny. He'll walk up to a group of people and say, you know, that's a great pen. Can I buy that pen for a penny? And people like to be in on something. They'll do it. The next time he sells the pen for a dollar and goes on, he has raised nearly a million dollars doing this to feed the poor. And in Europe, earned enough money to fly back to the States and deliver it. All because asking kind people, would you do this? One person sold him a bottle of water or gave him a bottle of water. He sold it for $2. He found another place that would give him a six pack for two, uh, uh, you know, $2. So he held it on top of his head and stood by the beach where they were playing beach bullet volleyball. Sold that. And, and it's always, why? Because he's looking for a way to do good. He's being smart. And he's not arguing about, was Isaiah written by one guy or three? Well, if you're expecting something bigger than that to be Jesus, I got to disappoint you. I'm going to have to tell you, like Naaman, that it's simpler than you want it to be because it's simpler than you think it is. You want it complicated. It's not complicated. In fact, when they went up to Jesus and they asked him, what's the greatest commandment, what did he say? Love God and love each other. But he didn't stop there. He said, those two commandments on those 
hang all of the law and the prophets. In other words, listen to Jesus, love God, love each other. You don't need to worry about Moses and Elijah. Back to the transfiguration again and again and again. This is God's son. Listen to him. Any questions you've got for me in the last few minutes here? It means a lot to me that I was invited. Because, you know, there are some churches of Christ that don't like me much. But I love them to pieces. And they're still going to heaven. My dad went to heaven. I don't think he liked it the first few weeks. <laughs> but I think he's having a ball now. And I bet when my mama got there, he rushed up to her and said, I'm so sorry. <laughs> and my mama said, it took you long enough. Um, yeah, you know, she's she was to me the most remarkable woman in the world because she was pretty much abused for sixty seven years, and she lived half that time in nations that have access to firearms. I said, "Mom, if you'd shot him, you would have been out in 20. <laughs> she was nicer than me. Anyway, any questions at all? All right, I'm ever so grateful to Mike for inviting me and the elders for letting me come.